even the history of how people realize that stars could form black holes is 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 quite fascinating because the entire idea really just started as a thought experiment. And if you think of it's 1915, 1916 when Einstein fully describes relativity in a way that's the canonical formulation. It was a lot of changing back and forth before then and it's World War 1 and he gets a message from the Eastern Front from a friend of his, Carl Schwarzschild, who's who solved Einstein's equations, you know, between sitting in the trenches and like cannon fire. Um, it was joked that he was calculating ballistic trajectories. He's also perusing the proceedings of the Prussian Academy of Sciences, <laughs> as you do. <laughs> and he was an astronomer um, who had enlisted in his 40s. And he finds this really remarkable solution to Einstein's equations. And it's the first exact solution. He doesn't call it a black hole. It's not called a black hole for decades. But what I love about what Schwarzschild did is it's a thought experiment. It's not about observations. It's not about making these things in nature. Um, it's really just about the idea. He sets up this completely untenable situation. He says, imagine I crush all the mass of a star to a point. Don't ask how that's done because that's really absurd. Um, but let's just pretend, and let's just imagine that, that that's a scenario. And then he wants to decide what happens to space-time if I set up this confounding but somehow very simple scenario. And really what Einstein's equations were, te were telling everybody at the time was that matter and energy curve space and time, and then curved space-time tells matter and energy how to fall once the space-time shaped. So he finds this beautiful solution. And the most amazing thing about his solution is he finds this demarcation, which is the event horizon, which is the region beyond which not even light can escape. And if you were to ask me today, all these decades, over 100 years later, I would say that is the black hole. The black hole is not the mass crushed to a point. The black hole is the event horizon. And the event horizon is really just a point in space-time or, or a region in space-time. It's actually, in this case, a surface in space-time. And it marks uh, a separation in events, which is why it's called an event horizon. Everything outside is causally separated from the inside insofar as what's inside the event horizon can't affect events outside. What's outside can affect events inside. I can throw a probe into a black hole and cause something to happen on the inside. But the opposite isn't true. Somebody who fell in can't send a probe out. And this one-way aspect really is what's profound about the black hole. Um, sometimes we talk about the black holes being nothing because at the event horizon, there's really nothing there. Uh, sometimes when we, when we think about black holes, we want to imagine a really dense, dead star. But if you go up to the event horizon, it's an empty region of space-time. It's, it's more of a place than it is a thing. And Einstein found this fascinating. He helped get the work published, but he really didn't think these would form in nature. I doubt Carl Schwarzschild did either. Um, I think they thought they were uh, solving theoretical, mathematical problems, um, but not describing this, what turned out to be the end state of gravitational collapse. And maybe the purpose of the thought experiment was to find the limitations of the theory. So you, you find the most mm -hmm. extreme versions in order to understand where it breaks down. Yeah. And it just so happens in this case that might actually predict these extreme kinds of objects. It does both. So it also describes the sun from far away. So the same solution does a great job helping us understand the Earth's orbit around the sun. It's incredible. It does a great job. It's almost overkill. <laughs> you don't really need to be that precise as relativity. Um, and yes, it predicts the phenomenon of black holes, but it doesn't really explain how nature would form them. But then it also, on top of that, does signal the breakdown of the theory. I mean, you're quite right about that. It actually says, oh man, but you, you go all the way towards the center, and yeah, this doesn't sound right anymore. Um, sometimes I liken it to, you know, it's like a dying man marking in the dirt <laughs> that something's gone wrong here, right? It, it, it's signaling that, that there's some culprit, there's something wrong in the theory. And, um, and even Roger Penrose, who did this general work trying to understand uh, the formation of black holes from gravitational collapse, he thought, oh yeah, there's a singularity that's inevitable. 
It's in every, there's no way around it once you form a black hole. But he said this is probably just a shortcoming of the fact that we've forgotten to include quantum mechanics and that when we do, we'll understand this um, differently. So according to him, the closer you get to the singularity, the more quantum mechanics comes into play and therefore there's no singularity, there's something else. I think everybody would say that. I think everybody would say the closer you get to the singularity, for sure you have to include quantum mechanics. You just can't consistently talk about magnifying such small scales, having such enormous uh, ruptures and and curvatures and energy scales and not include quantum mechanics. That that's just inconsistent with the world as we understand it. 